So welcome everyone. Good afternoon. This is a webinar hosted by the Defence Green Network. Um, please note that we are recording the session today and that recording has now started. Uh, we have a number of people still joining us, but I will start with an introduction as, as people settle in. So there are just a few notices and reminders. Firstly, for the audience, please could you keep your microphones on mute and your videos off uh, unless you are invited to speak and ask a question. Um, this will help us reduce the background disturbance for our speakers as we progress. So I'm sharing the screen currently, which shows the title and the names of our speakers. If this isn't visible to you, um, then you might want to try refreshing your browser or potentially leaving the call and rejoining may fix the problem. If problems persist, the slides are available on the Defence Green Network homepage that you could follow along separately. And also the recording will be available um, after the event should you have any real problems. Now, if we do have some network issues, then please do try to rejoin us as soon as you can. If we were to lose a presenter, then it is likely that we may need to stop the session and reschedule the event to another time. Now, importantly, we do encourage questions throughout the event, so please do use the instant messaging panel and put your questions as they occur to you, and we will relay these to the speakers at the end of the event. And if there are any questions that we're not able to answer during the session, we will do a Q&A document so that you will get the answers that you've asked for. And also, if time allows, then we can invite questions by the raise a hand facility as well. So without further delay, then I'd like to introduce today's webinar. It's on the topic of sustainable infrastructure and this links to the newly published climate change and sustainability strategic approach, which describes the MOD's ambition to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions as part of the UK's net zero commitments. So we're going to start today at the macro scale. We're going to be looking at carbon throughout the whole life cycle of the building. And we welcome Peter Egan, who's a lead member of the Institution of Royal Engineers Sustainability Forum. And then we're going to move to the project level and we're going to hear from Paul Ruddick, who's the chairman of REDS 10, who's been working on designing and operating modular buildings and how these are making a difference to us in defence. And we're also going to hear from Melanie Warman on this year's Sanctuary Awards before we open up the floor for our question session. So, um, Peter, you're up first. It's over to you. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, so I will just put my presentation up so everyone can see me. Hopefully you can all see that now. So my name is Peter Egan and I am the lead for the Institution of Royal Engineers Sustainability Forum uh, and I'm going to talk to you today about the whole life carbon cycle approach. So what we're going to go on through over the next 20 minutes. So we're going to look at who are the Institution of Royal Engineers Sustainability Forum. We're going to have a look at what the whole life carbon cycle approach is. Uh, how we can make a difference as an MOD and as individuals in our different organisations. Sort of covering the topic of can we redesign to renew our products, not just buy new all the time? How can we make a change in our carbon footprint? And then we're going to have a look at the next steps and um, who can help us on this journey towards a better sustainable future. Uh, so who are the Institution of Royal Engineer Sustainability Forum? Well, we are a part of the Institution of Royal Engineers. We were set up in January this year to, to drive forward an education on sustainability within the, the military. Uh, with a professional association related to the core of Royal Engineers. Uh, and if you want to know anything more about us or get involved in anything we do, uh, we do most of our business through LinkedIn and you can see the QR code on the screen, hopefully. Um, and we, if you wish to register as a member of the Institution of Royal Engineers Sustainability Forum, there's a QR code on there. And you don't have to be a member of our institution to be a member of the forum. But let's get more into today's subject. So what is the whole carbon life cycle approach? Well, it's assessing a project from its conception to its completion and the life beyond. So right at the beginning stages of a project, when we're looking at how a project can move forward, then we should be doing an assessment of the lifespan and the carbon we're willing to accept within that project. Now, within the net zero 2050, many people are concentrating on the operational carbon of a project. And that is a really important part of any project as it can 
on a majority of infrastructure buildings and other projects, it takes up to 80% of the carbon released within that uh, requirement. But we also shouldn't ignore the rest of that carbon of where it's being produced, how it's being produced and how it's being recorded within our projects. So right at the beginning at the conceptual, the specification, the procurement level, we can make a real impact in the way our projects are delivered by understanding this bigger picture. So the diagram here we've got on the screen is a breakdown of the carbon cycle within an infrastructure project. And I am going to base most of this next 15 minutes on infrastructure, but I'd like you to have a look at your own projects, your own area of working and see how this same mechanism can be mapped upon what you do within your day to day work, because it's not just an infrastructure problem. It's across all our procurement. Everything we do within the MLD needs to address this problem and its whole life carbon approach. So looking at the project here, we can see we've got the production stage, we've got the construction stage, so the materials have been made, they've been brought into a single point of contact, they've then gone through a construction phase, the building or the asset have been completed, it's been handed over to each, each user and it's gone through its usable stage. But that the carbon footprint doesn't stop there because we use, we maintain, we repair, we even refurbish and some parts will replace elements of the, the asset we're working with. And through all that, there's an embodied carbon element to it. So we need to understand what that is, as well as the operational carbon through the energy use of the asset, as well as the bigger picture piece. And then when it comes to the end of use, when we no longer within our requirement have an, a use that asset, what are we going to do with it then? Can it be reused? be uh, re recycled or moved and used in another capacity or are we going to de de uh, deconstruct it if we are we've got to transport them parts to another place how are they going to be disposed of and what's the long-term uh, purpose or life of that material once we finish using a bit and all that needs to be considered within our life cycle so let's just have a look at what we can do within the, the design or the procurement stage of our project to try and remove the amount of waste that goes to landfill. And actually what we want to do is try and make that as close to zero as we physically can. So when we're looking at a project, when we're look, sitting down with the designers, the procurers, the specifiers, all these people, we need to look at the long-term use of that building. So when we set a specification, the product's gonna get refined, it's gonna get produced, it's gonna be sold towards be it a building an asset or whatever it is, and then we're gonna put it into use. But right at that specification stage, we can then say, oh, what do we want to happen with it when we, that use period is over? Be it 20 years as an asset, 50 years as a building, whatever it is. Do we want to then be able to maintain it and do something with it to bring it back into use? Do we want to be able to reconfigure it, uh, take it apart and put the materials into something else, which may be an asset we want to use or extend its lifespan? Do we want to be able to refurbish it so we can sell it? or put it to a different use, or does it, do we want it to be able to be broken down and that it can be put back into recyclement? And what we want in this process is that to be repeated. We want that circular economy, that circular society activity to keep going so these materials are not going to landfill. And we can do that right at the beginning of a project. We can say to somebody, if say using building as an asset as an example that we want the internal walls to be relocatable we want to be able to make an office space today into a conference room tomorrow and back again or it could be that we want an accommodation block for, to be designed in a way that it can in the future it possibly become an office block or again the other way around we need our assets to be able to adjust without over engineering them so let's unpack this a little bit more so we've talked about this life cycle. So we're talking from the materials being extracted from the ground. And if you look at the diagram on the left hand side, we're going around the circle in a clockwise direction. You're looking at materials being extracted from the ground and then going into that processing that then come to us as the end user uh, uh, and go through each usable life. We maintain it. And then at the end of it, we're going to knock it down or decommission it and it's going to go to another life. But within all that embodied carbon and that operational carbon of using it, 
there's also a lot of transport. Things will get moved from its procurement to its where it's manufactured. They're then going to get moved to its sale point. It's then going to get moved to us as a user. We're going to move it throughout its lifespan unless it's a built a fixed asset. And then at the end of its life, when we decommission it, then materials are going to get moved somewhere else. And we need to understand that that is a big part of the embodied carbon. So where can we make an impact in this? Well, it's in the planning stage. As you can see on the diagram on the right hand side, the planning stage is where we can make the biggest impact in all these projects. It's understanding what that asset's going to do and what we're going to do with it throughout its lifespan. So the aim is to build nothing is to make nothing new. If we can, it's an ex not extract any more materials, but we all know that it's probably not likely that we're gonna do that. So what we need to do is aim to build less. Can we design buildings that we build it today in 50 years time when it's at its end of its, its lifespan, we'll just pick it up and move it somewhere else. We'll reconfigure it into a use we want for it. So we're aiming to build less because what we do build can be reused. And if we can't do that, then we should be building clever. Then we should be building in a way that when we have to knock that building down at the end, that all the components can be optimized in a different way. So we should be looking to reduce the amount of carbon within our products when they're being built, and that we should be designing them to be recycled, refurbished, reused in another way. And we need to build our buildings to be more effective, okay, more efficient in their use. So what can we do to incorporate low energy products, uh, low uh, carbon, embodied carbon materials. So we're reducing the embodied carbon and the operational carbon. And a really good way of doing this is understanding how we use our assets today. So when we build a new asset, what we should be doing is surveys on it. So within a building, we would do an occupation survey. Within three months of it being commissioned and handed over, we should be going back into that building and saying, uh, is this building operating the way it was designed to? Is it using the right energy amount that we designed it to be? And if it's not, we should be looking at it and saying, are the users actually using it the way it was designed to be? Or does the design not fit in with the actual requirements we need? And should we be adjusting it? Should we be incorporating sensors to turn off heating and cooling systems if people open windows or fit, pin open doors for too long? Should the system be working to reduce the amount of energy it uses? And then we should be doing this again tw after 12 months from occupation to make sure that the changes we made at that three month period are still being implemented and still being worked at that 12 month period. And then that should be an ongoing cycle. Every few years we should be going back in. And why should we be doing that? Well, people change. People move out of one organisation and new people come in. We need to make sure that these people are educated on how the building should be work, that the buildings are just into the needs of the users. And we should be completely continually doing that. And then at the end, of its, of its life, we should be doing another occupation survey to make sure that when we're finished with it, we know why we no longer need it, what we no longer want to do with it, and how we can adjust that building or, or learn from it for the new building to make a better product next time. So how can we make a difference? As I've said, the client is, is key in the role of changing the way we work. In our specification and in our procurement, we can make a huge impact in how we change the way our buildings and our assets are managed, used and developed. So in this example on the right hand side, what you can see is a structure of a building. The foundations have been made to pretty much be everlasting. The structure, the main structural elements of it would take a lot of embodied carbon, have been designed to last 100 years. The facade on the outside of it has been designed to last 50 years, so it's going to have one change in its life. And can that material be refurbished and reused in a different way? And then if we go into the services, they've been designed to last to 30 years because technology changes, we're going to have to improve our energy requirements and so on. And then the materials inside, they've got a shorter lifespan, but they need to be made out of materials that are not heavy in embodied carbon because when we want to refurb them, we need to be able to take them away, do something with them and then reincorporate them into a building later. And then there's the objects we use inside the building, our computers, our tables, all the other assets we bring in, you know, how, how often are we going to change them? Can we design them to have a minimum impact, a minimum energy use, and so on and so on. But when we're looking at this within our assets, we don't need to start from scratch. People have been looking at this process for the last 20 years, and there's some really good leading guidance out there. 
So Ariba, who is a, a major architectural organization, I've been setting the two standards what I've just shown you on the screen now. By 2030, they want all their new buildings, infrastructure and renovations to have at least 40% less embodied carbon than they do today. OK, so this is reducing their embodied carbon and reducing their operational carbon. Then by 2050, they want a net zero across the board of all embodied carbon and all operation carbon. What do they mean by that? Well, what they mean is that the materials we're designing for 2030 are going to be recycled. They're going to be reorganized in a way that they can be incorporated into the new buildings in 2050. So when we're removing one asset, we're recycling it and incorporating it into a new one. And we should be designing for that. We should be specifying that at the beginning that this building, this asset needs to be able to be recycled and recorporated into something else. And in procurement, we can tell people to do that. One thing the Sustainability Forum is looking to start a campaign at the moment is to remove OPC 100% cement from our procurement system within the MLD. Why? Because it's just a stepping stone in the right direction that we shouldn't be using one of the biggest impactors of CO2 in the world at 100%. If we can reduce it by 10%, then we should be. And if we do that in procurement, it helps in the education piece across the organisation is we've removed 10% without having to do anything else. And it should be a stepping stone approach. Ariba setting them targets, I broke it down into stepping stones. So when they're working with their procurers, they're working within their projects, they can say, this is what we're doing today. This is what we're going to do tomorrow. And we're going to have this stepping stone approach to heat the target because you can't expect the industry to move overnight, to change 100% the way it works because the procurement streams are just not there for them at the moment. And as we're doing the stepping stones, we can develop these other assets with us as we move forward. So this is just an example on the screen. I'm not going to go through it. If you you uh, you could, if you Google Ariba climate change targets, all these metrics will come up and you can see them. But it's just an example of a stepping stone approach. So what's the next step? Where should we be going? Well, the MOD has a huge part to play in this because we are policymakers and we are investors. We are a government agency. We are a huge uh, budget and a huge impact. Uh, as you can see at the top of the screen here where it says cities, I've put, put Garrison and Estates because we have a huge infrastructure uh, body which we can use to drive forward industry as a standard. And also as investors, we have a huge amount of money to invest into different organisations and different um, bodies and we should be using that power, that wealth to push the industry how we wish them to go. So I'm just going to zoom in to where we should be looking to go at the moment, because we've already passed the first stepping stone of writing our strategies and our policies to move towards this. So where should we be by 2050? Well, all government agencies should be implementing an embodied carbon target. Now, we should be looking to do that. We should be adopting our infrastructure to reduce the amount of carbon within it and the amount of carbon and towards a net zero standard. And when we're investing, we shouldn't be investing in people who have not bought into this policy, who are not following our approach. And as it was mentioned earlier, the MLD, Climate Change and Sustainability Strategy approach, is driving us towards a net zero future. So we should be making sure when we're purchasing our products, when we're buying into contracts, we're following this process. And that's where we should be driving towards 2025 as a stepping stone towards that net zero. So how can we do that? Well, we can't do it on our own. It's got to be within collaboration. It's got to be with communication with our partners. It's got to be educating the organisation we work in up and down the chain, uh, but also across the people we work with. We need to keep investing in innovation because the, we need to reduce the amount of energy and the amount of operational and embodied carbon we are creating within our products. And we can only do that by innovation. And we need to regulate the way we're going to work through this. So how have we started this? Well, I've just mentioned the climate change and sustainability strategy approach that's been written. It's a really good guideline on how we should be moving forward. But this year, the Environmental Act uh, will come into place from the Environmental Bill 2020, and that will drive forward the standards for the future. But we shouldn't be waiting for that to happen. We know what's in it. If you Google the Environmental Bill of 2020, you'll be able to read which is in that document, and we should be driving that way forward. And the MLD have already taken steps to do that. The kids programme, if you've not seen it, it's on Defence Connect. You can get access to it. It's a really good way of looking at our infrastructure, our procurement towards a sustainable future. And it's a really good first stepping stone on that roadmap. 
Uh, JSP850 is, is just launched the new SEER program, which is a really good way of uh, conceptualizing sustainability within our projects for infrastructure. And there's also a new project delivery framework for the way we should be implementing our projects with sustainability in mind. But once we've got all this collaboration, this communication, this education, this innovation and this regulation together, and we're understanding that piece, we should be combining it. And then once we've got a good grasp of it, we should be using that to accelerate forward and try and bring our stepping stones one step closer every time. So because if we can beat them targets, that's wonderful. But what we shouldn't be doing is pushing them targets back because we haven't done the education piece. And the education kit piece is the key card to carrying this all this rope together. So who can help? Well, in the infrastructure world, there's a number of people out there who can assist us. Um, be it Aviva, as I've already talked about, the uh, DIO, I've got some really good organisations uh, set up who can assist us. Uh, the Istro Key, I've got a really good sustainable guide in the infrastructure world, but actually just their process they have set out can be used in any stream. The uh, ICE, in collaboration with Bath University, have organised a really good carbon calculator, which is free to use on the, online. And it's a plethora of environmental organisations out there who can provide advice and assistance. But a really good starting point with actually is the guide I've listened, I've shown there on the left hand side. The uh, Chartered Institute of Building, I've developed a guide called the uh, TM65 Embodied Carbon, and it's actually based around mechanical infrastructure but their system of getting suppliers and contractors to be able to explain their carbon footprint in three different mechanisms from basic to advanced is a really good way of taking a stepping stone of bringing our procurement with us on this journey towards a sustainable future. So if you haven't seen it, I advise, please have a look at it. It will map across any industry and any um, asset procurement. It's designed around mechanical infrastructure, but the, the process is actually universal. So please go out there, or if you just wish for advice on where to go and where to start, feel free to come and speak to us at the Institution of Royal Engineers Sustainability Forum. Um, and now one of our members will be happy to assist you in that. So I want to thank you for listening to me for the last 20 minutes. I hopefully I've given over something to you. Uh, and what I want to do now is welcome Paul Ruddick from REG10. But before I pass over to him, if you ever need to get hold of us, please contact us on LinkedIn on our QR code or register with us as an organisation. We're here to help and we're here to, to help on that roadmap. But that's my, my plea over. Please, Paul, take it away. Thank you, Peter. Right, I'll just stop sharing my screen so you can have it back. Yep. All yours. Okay. Can you see my screen okay? Yes, it's there, thank you. Okay, thank you. Oh, thank you, thank you, Peter. Um, so I'm gonna give a more of a, a macro, uh, sorry, Peter gave a macro overview there of the carbon agenda. Uh, and what I'm gonna do today is talk about a more kind of a micro level um, and talk, talk to you about how we've, um, what we've, what we've achieved on the NetCap program. So I'm Paul Roddick, I work for a company called REDS10 uh, and we're a new type of contractor in that basically we are our MMC modular contractor. Uh, and that basically means that we have our own factory, we, we build the buildings in our factory up to 85% complete and then we transfer them to site and, and install them. And basically that means that uh, the, the period on time is a lot shorter and it also means that the, that the um, disruptions a lot, lots more, and we also have a control conditions. So if I talk about the NETCAP program, so NETCAP program was awarded a, a sanctuary award, um, and basically it's the kind of rebuilding the train in the state, replacing the Nissan huts and the kind of facilities that have been there for the last 80, 90 years, uh, and it's bringing it up right up to date. Uh, we've done this in partnership with the DIO and Landmark, and the brief was is to build um, new training accommodation, which was for 46 persons uh, to be split into two sections. Sorry, what was that for me? Hello? Sorry. Oh, Roger. I'll be there. Sorry, Paul, I think we've got a live mic somewhere. If we can just okay. continue. Yeah. Um, and it was um, to be DREAM excellent. 
net zero carbon was with the original target, um, 13 weeks on site, which I talk about, and 90% built in the factory. And this is the map of where we where we put them. Now the screen's grown quite a bit from the first inception. So the, the original program was to build a prototype, learn from the prototype, uh, and have a continual learning process to to get the energy usage down, to understand how the buildings are used, understand how the servicemen are using those uh, facilities, and how we can uh, link back into it. So the current um, delivery output is 40 of these across different camps. We've built 20 of them, and we've done that in a 12-month program to date. And if I just show you the next screen, these are the camps that have been completed. So I'm no doubt some of you will recognize the names of these camps. So you've got West Ham in the top left-hand corner. West Ham was where we put the first prototype built in. So originally there's one building there. Uh, we built that, we learned from it. Uh, we, we looked at the embedded carbon, we looked at the operational carbon, uh, and we looked at the energy usage. And we've taken learnings from there, and we've then taken them onto the few further scheme. So we've got Brunswick, Castle Martin, and Nescliffe, uh, and West Ham. And just put into perspective, um, those buildings, they, if you look at Nescliffe in the bottom right-hand corner, they had similar, similar buildings to, in the background, the, the Nissan huts. But in a space of uh, 13 weeks, we transferred them there and we put these new buildings in. So the camp was in kind of minor disruption during the period. And where we say that we um, build them in the factory, we, we literally build the whole units in the factory. So this is inside one of our factories on the left-hand side. And as you can see, we've got six, six buildings there. Um, and once they're done, um, we kind of store them up in our factory. And on the right-hand side, it's been stored externally. So when a, when a camp's ready, uh, when we've got space, we'll, we'll drop them in. So in the next couple of weeks, we're dropping four more in at Nook Camp and five more in at West Ham Camp. And in terms of embedded carbon, uh, volumetric or factory construction, it's going to be probably about 15 to 20% more efficient than traditional construction. And that's purely because, um, you know, we have less deliveries, everyone's working on the same, same space, productivity is way higher. Uh, we don't have issues with, with, with weather or, 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 or rain. The buildings themselves, um, they're dropped in in one day um, and they're, they're, they're installed. And then once they're installed, we've got a period of um, another four weeks of finishing them off and doing the external paths and, and they're handed over. So literally we've been on camps where um, those undertaken training left on the Friday and they come back on the Monday and there's three buildings there. Uh, and it's, 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 it's quite a sight to behold. And what's happening is that we submit a plan applications and all the camps, so future phases we can we can we can change. And what's quite interesting uh, about this is that already we are getting feedback from the camps where they've been installed. Is that the maintenance is lower, um, the morale is higher, uh, more money is now spent on the training estate. So fire and ranges, more money has been spent on them rather than upkeep upkeeping um, the old the old buildings and doing, doing the health and safety checks. So that's the program, that's the offsite, but I'm here to talk to you about um, carbon today. So on the top right-hand corner is, is basically the EPC rating. Uh, now the EPC rating is, is you'll see on your fridge or, or, or electronics, and it's kind of, it's a bit of a clunky way of seeing how much energy is used in the building and, and that's gonna be changed. But what it does show is, is the, the improvement that we've made over the last 12 months in a different scheme. So we've gone from West Down Camp, which is the prototype, which is kind of plus 12, uh, and now we're basically um, down to minus nine for the latest camp that we've done. And that's, that basically means that these buildings are generating more energy than they're using. Um, and we've, 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 we've done that under a number of ways. So the first thing is the U values. Um, so we've increased the U values of the building. So it's, it's harder for energy to, to leave the building uh, and it's harder for sunlight to enter the building. Um, and it's way above building regs. The issue with the U values, obviously, was you know there's there's a bit of a contradiction there, as, as Peter said. So um, to make the walls have higher U values, then you they need to get thicker, so more material goes in there. Uh, but and also there's there's issues in terms of CTM, um, and also now there's issues with using timber uh, in, in the building. So there's a kind of a contradiction in terms of uh, reducing the embodied carbon and, and increasing the U values. And the other way we've improved the building is the air tightness. Um, so limiting the amount of air can get out of the building. So you, you, you literally, you, your energy is not getting out of the building. So you may hear a lot about air tightness and new values. But what I've just tried to do here is just to kind of demonstrate in a, in a kind of presentation of a pretty granular level. So the net cap building, uh, if, and you'll see different ratings at the top of 
10, 5, 3.6, 2.5 and 0.6. What does that actually mean in terms of air tightness? So under building regulations, you can have an air tightness of 10 and that transfixes to basically having five footballs, holes around the building where energy can escape from. Now, good practice um, says you should have one uh, around about five, which, which is a single one. Now, the first net cap building that we built, uh, the prototype, um, those little small ones are meant to be uh, pool balls, um, misspent youth. Um, and that's the kind of the hole in the building where, where energy is getting out. The current net cap um, design that we're doing at the moment is, is kind of nine. And you hear about passive house standard, how much air escapes to the building. It's basically a, a hole in the facade. So where I say hole, it's not a hole, it's where air escapes around the windows, through the doors, through the wiggles, through the jo joints. That's how much air can escape from a building. So I wanted to put that up there because it gives you a bit of kind of context of what, what actually it means in terms of air tightness in the building. But that's how we're reducing operational energy in, in, in a building. And good air tightness is, is, is simply good detailing, uh, which then comes back to the factory operation. So we, we, we built some schemes down in Castle Martin. It's a long way from anywhere, but so having kind of the QA and the quality um, on that when everyone's so far away, but in the factory, we're in controlled conditions, we have QA sign off process. So we can make sure that the air tightness and the detail around the windows and the doors is done properly. Um, and this, this really makes, an, make, makes a difference when you wanna to get to a net zero building. It's, 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 this, is, this is what you have to do. Um, and it's just good conditions and how we dress, dress around the windows. So, Although you kind of hear all this, this is, these are the figures you've got to achieve. This is actually what it means when you're, when you're trying to achieve um, push, pushing through the building. In terms of the building itself, um, I'm going to talk through the key systems that we, we put in place. So it's got PVs on the roof, uh, then they go to an air source heat pump, and then we have a hot water tank, which we have underfloor heating, uh, which puts around the building. The biggest energy use in this building, 80% of the energy use is, is the hot showers. That's, that's, that's where the energy is being used. So we need to make sure that the, the, the energy um, is kind of kept to a minimum. Um, and the PVs using the SLC pump, basically the, the SLC pump will multiply the PV energy by 2.3 uh, and then push it into the, into the building. So this is how we're getting more and more um, better carbon um, use in the building. We've also addition, um, included dehumidifiers in, in, in the building. So in the drying rooms, so in the prototype, we didn't have this, we, we looked at it. So it's basically taking the heat out of the hot heat out of the air, not putting it outside, putting it outside and losing that energy. So we're keeping it within the building. We kind of we, we clean it and filter it and then push it back into the building. So these are just things you need to do to basically to get down to the energy use. Um, and then we've got heat recovery dot work. So we're keeping the hot air um, out of the showers and recirculate that and clean it and filter it and putting it back into the building. But to get to your uh, energy target, this is what you need to do um, in, in, in the building. So this, this graph here is, is, is interesting. So um, EUI is basically what the government are telling us how much energy the, the building needs to run in, in operation. And if you look back to 2012, the, the guidance from SIBSI was 254. Um, and now uh, they're saying by 2025, it's got to go down to 60. So even in that period of time, the, the, the government um, advice is, is reduced by 80%. So we've got you 20% of the energy to, to run a building. Um, in 2021, the buildings now, you, you've got to get down to one, 120. So, so to run the building, to run the showers, it, it's 120. And then you've got to go down to 60 and, and 35. So currently, um, at the net cap building, we're at 70. So we're way ahead of we should be. Um, and with those improvements, as I just explained to you in terms of the air dehumidifiers, the air, um, air heat recovery systems, we've got the current um, net caps down to 55. So we're ahead of where we should be to 2025. But the challenge is now is how do we get to 35? Um, and if you speak to any engineer, um, any designer right now, when people say, how are we gonna get, there? everyone scratches their head. You know, everyone says, oh, it's impossible. I, we, we don't understand how you do it. But, but in terms of the building, if we take the net cap buildings is, um, we can't do, we've got no big wins left. The, the systems we've got in there are the most efficient. So getting down to 35 is continual refinement of the system to making sure energy is being used at certain time. But the other uncomfortable truth is, is actually it's going to come down to user, how the users are using the building. Um, and there will come a time in, in that to get to 55, there will come, come guidelines and say, to hit that energy target, you can only have a shower for two minutes. Or, it, it, you know, you come in there and open the windows. 
that's what it's got to do. But we're continually refining the building to get down to, to that number. And I'm just going to talk to you about that now um, after this. Sorry, um, embodied carbon. Um, so if we're talking about embodied carbon on, on the West Down prototype to, to the buildings we build now. So we reduced it by 33%. Um, and, and actually, we did that relatively simple with some quick wins. So we had concrete floors, which were the um, JSP specification. Uh, we challenged that and we used recycled concrete gifter flooring as well. 50% recycled, um, huge reduction in body carbon. Um, we replaced steel partitions with timber. Um, we replaced stainless steel sanitary with ceramic cera sanitary wear. Um, and we reduced um, concrete attenu attenu attenuation tanks through, through soak, soak waste. So specification of materials and, and, and actually when we first suggested these, a, a lot of the um, people from DIO kind of shook their head and said, no, that's JSPs, that's what we've got to do. But with the carbon agenda um, and with support with DIO and Landmark at senior level, we were able to change perceptions on the carbon um, agenda. And, and, and actually, that, that's a great thing. I, I think a lot of people kind of um, think carbon's, a, a, you know, because it costs a load of money, a lot of difficulties, but actually, these are quite easy decisions and actually makes building the buildings um, qu quicker and easier. So in terms of the improvement from the West Down prototype um, to, to the buildings we've got now, uh, which I've just gone through, we've put more PV on the roof, heat recovery, dehumidifiers, uh, reduced the embodied carbon. Uh, we're looking at future um, improvements in terms of um, thermal storage, um, rainwater harvesting. And we've also had specification enhancements in terms of the building, the, the feedback from the end users. We've added mat wells, we've improved the fit out of it. But what I'd like to say is that we've done all this with no additional cost. Um, we've done this in partnership with DIO and Landmark. So the building has got more in it, but actually, because it's a program of 40 buildings, when I first started building the building in our factory, it was taking us 13 weeks. Um, but now we've got that down to nine weeks. So we've shared in the benefit, we've shared in the cost savings. And what we've done, we've put it back into the building. Um, by taking concrete flooring out of the building, we save money. Um, because the gift of flooring was cheaper and actually it's a much better way to, we can, it's a dry dry trade. So we use that saving, we pay for additional PV on the roof to, to, to make sure that we could get more generation um, to get to net zero carbon. So again, I just want to kind of say that with with, with partnership and, and being a collaborative approach, this doesn't need to cost a lot of money. It, in fact, it's within the original budgets of, of, of the way, way, way we spent it. The, what I just spoke to about is um, smart technology development. So these buildings are probably the most technologically advanced buildings at, on, on, on the Army estate. They're full of sensors. Um, all the bits of plant talk to each other. It's kind of an, it's an open cult protocol, uh, IAT. So we literally, we know how much energy water is being used, when the rooms are occupied, when the windows are open, how much hot water is being taken to use the showers, uh, when the heating is coming on, what the external temperatures are. So we put all this infrastructure in, into the buildings and the difficult part of doing that was getting all the bits of plant to talk to each other. So different manufacturers have different coding. Um, so the SLC heat pump's got different coding from the heat recovery unit. So we've gone over that thing. So, but basically what we've got now in 2021, we've got some real live data. So just picking up on Peter's point where he said you want your three month occupation and your, and your 12 month occupation um, surveys. To me, that's not good enough. You need to know within the minute what's happening with that building. Um, and we have that now. So in any NETCAP building, we can log on remotely. We can understand the energy usage in that building. Um, you know, we've, we've, we've highlighted certain aspects where um, the people on uh, standing in the units are leaving the windows and the doors are open all the time. They were, they were kind of jamming the, um, the doors to the drying rooms open. We got that feedback instantly and we fed back to the camp and they changed behaviors. Uh, and that change in behaviours reduce the energy usage. The, the next stage of, of, of what we're putting in here is automated controls. So the data we're getting back now, we're realising that south facing, south facing rooms have got more heat gain than the other side. So we're, we're changing when the under four heating comes on. Um, and we're doing that automatically and we're gathering the data. Um, so th this, this, this operating system will probably be the biggest legacy of, of NetCap. Uh, because it will give data back into the army and the DIO um, on their buildings and how they can plan and design for the future. But also it will give us an understanding of how these units are being used and gives instant feedback um, from, from, from those occupying it as well. So these are coming to part of the data we're getting back, the, the room temperatures, solar power when it's been generated, the hot water, um, how long the shower's been used for, um, the total power load, the active power load, um, 
this is interesting because on the training estate, um, as you'd imagine, there's issues with um, electricity supply. So we've, we've actually found the data. So originally the design was a peak load of 60 watts and a kilowatts. And now we're looking at um, it's actually near 30 or 40, which means infrastructure work doesn't need to happen. Uh, but also we can look at load shedding as well and when certain things come on. So really intelligent stuff on how you're using your estate and it's all reducing the energy. But coming back to the point of how we get down to 55 to 35, if you think about a, um, a Formula One car where it's telemetrics are constantly going around the track and you're feeding back into it and you're making tweaks and making changes, that's how we're going to get to that figure, having that live data. Um, this is just the power, you know, some of the data we're getting from. It shows when uh, the peak loads are happening in the building, when the PVs are happening, um, generating the most energy so we can plot it and understand how the building's being used. This is the dashboard data that um, Landmark and DIO are looking at now so they can readily understand what building. So in a year's time, they'll have a dashboard in there and they'll look across seven or eight training camps and it will tell them that at Nestcliff, they're using 30% more energy in those buildings than they are at West Ham. Um, which then we can go in and understand why. It, is the settings too high or is it user issues? Um, do we need to go down there and make, have an in, in, intervention? And this is the only way we're going to get carbon um, generation down. This, this, this is the way forward um, to, to get to those levels. I mean, I, I had this conversation, we're looking at kitchens at the moment. So in a, in a kitchen, for example, the, the biggest heat is the, is the ovens. So what tends to happen is they come in the uh, kitchen at six in the morning, they'll turn the oven on and they'll keep it on all day till five, six o'clock. Whether that, and that, it, that oven might be in use for 30, 40% of that time. The new ovens are designed, the combi ovens are designed that they'll get up to heat within um, 10 minutes. However, the users sometimes don't realise that because they've been used to kind of how it's operated before, still put the ovens on 20, 20 on all day. So what we're looking at now is that we will be able to monitor the, the oven usage in that, in that building. Um, so if the users are putting it on all day, we'll know about it instant, instantaneously, we can, go, we can go back. So again, it's looking at buildings where the energy is used the most. So changing blocks, it's the hot, hot water for thing. Um, obviously catering blocks, it's the, uh, um, it's the kitchen. But again, we're only going to reduce um, carbon is the technology that's been developed is the users use it properly. Um, so now we're looking at thermal storage. So we're trying to, um, all that energy at the moment is, that comes off, off the roof, if either goes into the SLC pump or in the evening, it goes back onto, um, in the, during the day, it goes back to the grid. So now we're saying, well, why don't, why don't we store that energy uh, through PCB thermal batteries? So we'll use that energy then to deheat up the hot water tank. So we'll get more bang back for the PV. Uh, we're not having to put it back to the grid. We give it back for 3P and they charge you 12P and plus the building becomes standalone. The idea is eventually these buildings will come off grid um, in terms of off grid. So we're looking now at kind of power, um, central power boxes, um, wind farms, uh, PV farms. And again, the data we're getting back, we're trying to see what the pig loads are, how they can be reduced, speak to the end user and just say, look, for five days a year, you're going to have an issue, you're going to have energy shortages. Are you OK to live with that? Um, if not, that's fine. We'll, we'll, we'll put the infrastructure in there. But again, it's giving the user that knowledge and that data to make an informed decision. And if they're sensitive about reducing carbon, this is how we need to do it. Um, CTM measures and stuff like that. The, the last couple of slides I just want to show you are um, in terms of volumetric is that obviously the net cap buildings have got a very simple trimmer panel finish on it. But we do other types of buildings. So whether it's wood clad or whether it's uh, brick slips in the factory, but this is how the level we complete the buildings to in the factory before we take them to site. These are some of the buildings that we've built recently. This is all volumetric, exactly the same, a double height score. This is a school we just, we just completed. Um, this is an, another school with curved walls and corner windows. Um, that's the, that the school we just completed. Uh, and this is the Imperial War Museum. So this is, this is up for awards, it's in the Architects Journal. But again, um, this is completely volumetric. Um, and it's really pushing the boundaries of what architectural volumetric do. So I don't want you to leave this um, presentation thinking volumetric factory construction, just about square boxes. It's, it's not, this is the future, this is where it's going, uh, but it's got huge benefits in terms of reducing the zero carbon. So sorry if I've gone on a bit there, but um, that's, that's the end of my presentation. Paul, thank you very much. Um, I think both the presentations from Peter and Paul there gave us lots of information and fascinating insight how we can make a difference and we are doing so already in defence, but equally interesting to know that human behaviour is going to play a big role in this too.
before we open up for questions and we have had quite a few comments and questions coming through um melanie would you like to talk about the sanctuary awards and the real the reason we're putting this into today's session is because paul's project was one of the uh, recipients of, a, of a, an award in last year's sanctuary awards in the sustainable construction category so was melanie. indeed Highly commended. Thank you very much for taking the time to enter, Paul. Um, thank you very much for inviting me along to chat to you about the Sanctuary Awards. So I'm Melanie Warman. I'm the Environmental Engagement Manager and I'm um, new in post, part of the Environmental Support and Compliance in DIO. Um, my team's responsible for delivering the Sanctuary magazine and the awards on behalf of FMC. Um, the Sanctuary Awards, they've been recognising outstanding contributions to, to, to sustainability and conservation across the Ministry of Defence and they've been running since 1991 now. So the awards are celebrating 30 years this year but the Sanctuary magazine is also celebrating 50 years. Um, in the early days Sanctuary was very much about heritage and nature conservation but as defence priorities have shifted those Sanctuary priorities have shifted as well and then this year obviously the Sanctuary Awards they're taking place against the backdrop of the new defence um, strategic strategic approach, which has already been mentioned. Um, this approach has obviously clearly laid out the department's ambition to reduce emissions, contributing to the net zero commitment, as well as enhancing its sustainability activity across the defence estate and as that kind of near term priority. Um, to meet that ambition, we know that we're already building on work that's already underway across defence. We've heard some great examples of it today, decarbonising the built estate as well as capturing that carbon, um, carbon capture and increasing that um, biodiversity. And there is lots of creative thinking about how to do this. Um, we're not coming from a standing start. What I would say and really advise is have a look at the past Sanctuary Award winners and the magazines as it really does highlight how sustainability has been embedded into what defence does and what defence does really well for decades. Um, so why should you enter the awards? <laughs> The Sanctuary Awards and the magazines is owned by FMC, who's being heavily promoted by James Clare. And what it is, is a brilliant forum to highlight the work that you've been doing in 2020 and how Defence continues to work to reduce its emissions, increase the um, sustainability of the business and the environment. There's going to be brilliant projects that you know about, spanning procurement, nature conservation, new building. You're going to know about great examples of team and individual contributions that deserve celebrating, I would love you to tell us more about it. Um, we've worked really closely with FMC and others to make sure that the award categories um, encourage and support the MOD sustainability objectives laid out in that strategic approach. And there's six categories. All of this is on our website, by the way. Um, Environmental Enhancement Award, Heritage Award, Social Value Award, the Net Zero and Resource Efficiency Award, so that's about um, projects contributing to that Net Zero Carbon Ambition, Sustainable Procurement and Construction Award, so this is um, supply chain, product lifestyle, um, improving sustainability of equipment or ser services, and then the Individual Achievement Award, so this is for people who have made that significant personal contribution to sustainability and we've had some great um, examples of that and all the winners of that are thrown into a pot um, and then will be considered for the sustainable business award which is for larger scale commercial pro projects and the silver otter trophy which has been running since um, 1991 and that's a community-led or individual um, effort on the estate all the information on how to enter and what it's all about and the more detail about those categories is in the Sanctuary Awards website. If you just Google Sanctuary Awards, it will um, come up. If you just do a Google, there's a Gov page. Um, there's details on that. Um, and yeah, please have a think about the projects. Please have a look. Um, it's pretty easy to enter. You need to give yourself about 45 minutes to an hour to fill out the form. Panel of judges from a wide range of disciplines will then judge that and you get to go to an awards set, set ceremony in main building in March if you win. Any questions? Give me a shout. Great. Thank you, Melanie. So on to our Q&A. Quite a few questions to come through. 
Um, the first one was from Suzanne Jordan. We were talking at the time, Peter, about the whole life um, approach to carbon. And uh, I think there was comments on your slides about 80% of energy is in the occupation. And Suzanne was questioning, is this a contradiction um, that we should be refurbishing existing assets in preference to a new build? Um, a lot of our infrastructure is actually beyond the end of life and cost of effective refurbishment is prohibitive. Have you got any comments on that, Peter? Yeah, so I um, I actually got a heritage background, which probably leads into this one a little bit. Is um, So to knock down a building and rebuild it is 10 times more in body carbon than it is to retrofit. So uh, there's a prime example at the moment in Derby. They're looking to knock down the lecture for the main exhibit hall in Derby. Uh, and rebuild a new one, uh, and the carbon assessment worked out at something like 15 times more carbon, embodied carbon in the knocking it down and rebuilding it. So if we're looking to do that with accommodation, you know, we're, in, we're uh, taking in a huge embodied carbon footprint in doing so. Now, not every building can be saved. It, it, that, you know, it's, it's near impossible to save every building. But if we're going to take a building down, can we recycle all its materials? Can we factor it in? Uh, there was a question in there about foundations is, if we're gonna design foundations to last a very long time within a building, at the end of that lifespan, can them foundations be reutilized for another building to be built on there? Or can they be recycled in a way that they can be incorporated back into a project? So we're not reproducing that embodied carbon. So there's a lot of work on there. Uh, there's some really good agencies actually specialise in this. There's the Sustainability, Sustainable Traditional Building Association. They have a retrofit wheel. If you've never heard of it, Google it. It's definitely worth, especially if you're going to do a house refurb. Uh, go on there, look at their sustainability wheel. You can click on all the different things you want to look at, like uh, the e &M services, the insulation, and it will tell you all the issues, what you're going to get in the building um, and how to deal with them. And then it will point you in the right direction of technical information on how to do that. But there's some really good organisations out there at the moment specialising in just this. Um, our, me and Paul were chatting on Monday about an example. Is the Nissan Hut. It's been around since 70, eight, uh, 1917. Um, the the most southerly post office in the world is a refurbed energy efficient Nissan hut, uh, which is in St. Georgia. Um, so the, these buildings can be refurbed. I'm not saying everyone needs to be, but they can be refurbed and we can reduce that embodied carbon. I think I'll leave that on there. Thanks, Peter. Uh, so the next question was from Matthew Whitnell. Can either speaker give any insight into best practice for considering sustainable power capacity forward planning in delivering projects, particularly when the project will require an uplift in the current site power requirements? So I, I think I'll hit on this one and then I'll hand it over to Paul because I'm sure he's got a lot more experience in his present project. But I think as a military, we miss a lot of opportunities with our power generation. We don't look at hydro at all. Um, this huge amount of power capability within hydro generation. Uh, we don't look at the micro level of power generation and how we can reuse our water supply within buildings uh, to create micro generation, which though sounds, why would you want to do it on a small scale? Lots of small scale adds up. Uh, so it, there's, an, a, it, there's a balance because you might not get the return on the effort to put in there on the carbon footprint in. But there's a huge piece of, we always just look at solar, we always look at air source heat pump, and they are a very good combination. But there's other ways of doing it, and I don't think we've put enough research into looking at the bigger picture. But I'll hand over to Paul there, I think he's got some comments on this. Yeah, I, I, as I just presented there, the, um, you know, we are looking at um, storing the PV in, in the building. We looked at batteries, uh, we've looked at um, PCP thermal thermal storage. Uh, we've also looked at putting wind farm on it. I mean, the training estate, you've got a huge amount of land there. So you, you, you should be able to take these sites off grid rather than page for huge upgrades in terms of your power usage. Um, I think one of the issues if, with your old estate and looking at refurbishment, obviously these buildings, when you come to refurbish, usually they're full of asbestos um, and they're, they're inefficient in their energy usage. So that, that needs to be calculated in, in, into your calculation. But there's huge opportunities. And what I would say is that the, the pace of technology will change is, is changes every year. So you can get more um, energy out of your PV, you know, increases five, ten percent every year, your, your, your wind power as well. Um, and it's just been, I think it's making sure you're, you're up with current technology. 
um, some of the projects we worked on where something was specified two, three years ago and they've just stuck with it and rather than saying actually this is the wrong solution. Uh, there's lots of stuff coming online at the moment. Thank you. Uh, so a couple of questions from Suzanne Jordan. So she's interested to know whether any of the projects have been delivered under permitted development rights and also what is the issue with a timber frame? Um, no, they've all got full planning. Uh, there's, there's no issue with a timber frame. We um, we are um, steel, um, it's a steel frame, but there's a couple of articles in the press at the moment uh, after Grenfell where uh, there's is misunderstanding in the industry about what what you can whether you can timber structural frame and whether you use timber in the external wall for your for your fire compartment. Um, it's a big overreaction on it, uh, but at the moment some planning authorities are refusing planning uh, on, on that basis. So it's hopefully it'll settle down uh, and, and people will be sensible about it. But there, there is an issue kicking around about that at the moment, which which doesn't make sense when you look over Europe because all their buildings are timber frame. America's all timber frame, um, but there seems to be a knee jerk reaction in the building regs and the planning authorities at the moment. Great, thank uh, you. Yeah, I'd fully agree with your thing there. It's education. We keep coming back to this thing is education because there's so many different types of timber structures from balloon frames to portal frames to platform frames. Different ones work different well. They have different levels with fire uh, and it's all about understanding the technology and the methods. We've been doing it for a thousand mm -hmm. years. Not every one of them burns down. The, it, there's definitely ways of dealing with fire in timber frames. Thank you. A couple of questions now about air tightness. Um, what's your view about air tightness versus internal air quality? And I think the question mm. came a second time um, under the obviously our COVID. Um, yeah, so we, we've, we've, we've gone as low as we can now in terms of our air tightness because because any, any lower than that, it will start to affect the quality. We've got triple vents in the windows. There's no forced mechanical ventilation in these buildings. Um, but I think when you start to look at the SLA buildings, there's going to be forced mechanical ventilation in those buildings because uh, people are going to be living in them. Yeah, there's also, depending on where in your world you are, air tightness is not always the solution. It works very well in, with the type of stuff Paul works with. Uh, you go in for that passive state. But actually, there's a lot of research out there to say that in certain parts of the world, the worst thing you want is air tightness because you're creating an energy demand where there's different ways of building the buildings in vernacular styling, where you can use natural airflows, use heat movement to actually drive airflows through the building. And when you're looking at things like COVID, uh, where you want that continual movement of air to clear it, uh, there is other ways of doing it, but it doesn't work in every part of the world, which is where we need to invest in passive as much as we can. Thank you. So another question about cooling buildings in summer. Do you incorporate shading on windows? Um, we don't at the moment. Um, we, we have blackout blinds on them, uh, but I, I do think in the future when we're looking at these, we, 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 it's interesting because the buildings are so well insulated and the windows have got sun tint in them. We're not seeing any overheating um, in, our, in our data yet, um, but there may be, as Peter said, there may be some kind of some of the camps in the south where we've got a particular issue. We may look at it, but um, at the moment we're not. I think for the SLA stuff, when that comes online, you'll, you'll put some solar shading on that. Yeah. Okay, so another question from Emma Burden. What precautions have been taken to assure that smart buildings remain security compliance? Yeah, so the, the, the buildings have got the ability for a switch off switch. So the, they, they can be controlled, um, so you can't get access to them in terms of, uh, they, there's actually a control panel in the buildings uh, that runs the building. Uh, and also, also they run on a, on a secure network, which we're working with uh, Landmark and DIO on. Great, thank you very much. Um, so a question about sort of the human, the users in the buildings, is the data available to the occupants? Um, if they were made aware that their data is being captured, ah. captured, would that give them a bit of a challenge and a competition to, to be most efficient in, in, their, in their use of their buildings? Yeah, I mean, that, that's exactly the next step we're looking for. It's a really good question because actually what what we're trying to find out now is what is what the baseline energy use in a building should be. Hmm. So what, what we're speaking to Landmark about is actually putting a screen in the building and saying, right, you're in here for five days and you've got X amount of energy to use. Um, and just and it's about education as well. So they can then track it and say, right, OK, we're under or over um, because it, it's about education. 
So, so it's, that's exactly the direction of travel we're on. What, what we're trying to develop now is, is basically a, a system, an understanding of the build and how it's working. And once we've got that, we can, then we can share that. And that's why I say I think the, this, this build and operating system is probably be the biggest legacy in NetCap because then, yeah. if chosen, you can then put it across your whole estate. Yeah. Yeah. I've, I've, what Paul was saying earlier on about capturing all the data as live data is a really good thing to know because we've actually forgotten a lot of stuff. 200 years ago, buildings were designed on occupational use. They were designed that people only use certain spaces of the building at a certain time. They used to put livestock in the building to generate heat so they could live right next to it. Probably don't advise doing that today. But, uh, but um, we've forgotten that knowledge. Cheap energy, which came around in the late 1800s and went throughout the whole of the 1900s uh, and up to today, has removed that knowledge from us. And we've got to relearn that. And as Paul just said there, education is a key part of that. And this data is a great piece. Um, and when I was mentioning about occupation surveys earlier on, uh, it's all about educating the end user because a building's been designed to work in a certain way. The norm where the thing what uh, causes that energy to be more higher in usage in reality is the end users, it's not the building itself. Thank you, we will draw to a close now, it's one o'clock. I do thank both yourself, Peter and Paul for your time today and also for the audience, for your questions and your attendance. Um, please do join us again. We have another session planned in July when we're going to hear what's going on at the South Cerny um, focused around solar power. And um, thank you for joining us. That's all for today. No, thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. you. Goodbye. Bye. You know, Peter, do you just want to stay on for two minutes? Just yes, we will. Yeah, just something. Okay. Thanks, guys. There's loads of messages of thanks coming through. So, thank you for your time today. It's been brilliant. Thanks, Cindy. Hi, Paul. It's Dave Lowe. Mind if I uh, stop on? I'm just going to catch up with uh, Peter. Hi, Dave. How are you doing? Yeah, sure. Hi, just Dave. give me a second to yeah. start the recording. Yeah.